So today we have lecture six in the class. I need to remind you the class is live streamed on YouTube and it's available publicly afterwards as always. Last two classes, we've been going over homework a lot. So we haven't really covered some of the topics that we'd planned uh, before. And so I wanted to uh, try to cover some of those issues today. So the outline today is I want to cover something that I've done with people individually, but um, is important enough that I'd like to review it, which is how to uh, find and download uh, SPML models from Biomodels database and convert them into Anemone and run them. I realized when we did this uh, with some of the students that that the uh, the uh, documentation of the Anemone Tellurium cheat sheets is a little out of date. And so I wanna make sure that you have the correct syntax for that and a little bit of experience for that. Then we may skip some of the details of how to calculate the michaelis menten rate law uh, if people are really interested, see how it goes. But if, if we skip it, it'll be in the slide deck. And then uh, we'll do hill, hill functions and uh, a few exercises related to hill functions of michaelis menten uh, to close out. And then if we have a lot of time, I'd like to talk about uh, how to translate uh, regulatory arrows to rate laws and begin to think about uh, the kinds of questions we can answer with models. Again, I don't know if we'll make it that far. Uh, one of the things that I'm realizing, uh, this is a pretty sophisticated class in terms of background. And uh, we're spending a fair amount of time in class on problem sets. And that means we're having a little less time to do lectures. And so that does mean that I need people to do more of a flipped classroom style uh, course where you do uh, the reading on your own. Uh, Herbert's textbook is really designed to be used for self-study. It's very good that way. And so uh, I would ask people to uh, work on chapters uh, four. I realize this is a lot of chapters. I'm not expecting everybody to do them all at once. Uh, four, five, seven, 12, and 14, and appendices E and I in the textbook. Uh, we've already covered a lot of the material in chapters four and seven. Uh, one of the homework problems is specifically addressing uh, not this week, but next week, we'll be specifically addressing the material in chapter 14. And Appendix E is on rate laws and the derivation of Hill, Hill functions of michaelis menten and some other rate laws that we won't cover. And so I, I strongly encourage people to look at that. Uh, a lot of the material will cover matches the textbooks. Some of the topics will cover supplementary. So one thing I realized uh, when we were going over the homework uh, from last week was that the homework problems that were officially due today uh, covered material that we hadn't really talked about very much. In principle, the homework problems had all of the information you needed to solve them successfully, uh, but I thought that people might appreciate an extra week uh, with the material we're going to cover today to be able to get those prepared. Uh, but I did assign two additional problems, uh, which are not homework problems so much as uh, preparation for the project. I've met with all of the project groups in the past week, which is great. I know people are busy getting their ideas together and that's good. Uh, so the first uh, problem, which I thank our TA for uh, designing and Aiden for modifying and, and updating, is to try to develop a project timeline. And uh, I'd like people next week to give a very brief presentation of their project timeline uh, next week and then in more detail the following week. And so uh, we really don't have that much time. You're going to need to have a preliminary version of your project ready by before the week before Thanksgiving because if you're going to correct that project and upload it to NatoHub, that, that requires a couple of weeks of turnaround. 
And so it's essential that you have a working version of your code uh, and a draft of the project done before Thanksgiving. So there's time for a critique and a second round of revision. Uh, and, and to help you with thinking about that, I've asked you to review as teams, these are both team assignments, uh, review with the other people in your team, uh, Nato Hub app, and I'd like you to present it next week. I'd like to present you to present your review. Uh, not incredibly long, uh, but I would like you to be able to demo the app. Uh, and I've given you a list of questions to ask about the app as something that is a tool that you might use. And I'd like you to talk about those issues uh, with the, the audience. Basically, the question is how effective is it as a, does it work in the first place? Is it appealing? Uh, when you go to the splash page, is it something you click on? Does it in fact uh, give the biology background in an effective way? Does it give the mathematics in an effective way? Are the exercises and simulations that you do there useful or not? Uh, because if you've done a review of an existing app, whether it's good or bad, you'll have a much better idea of what you need to do for your own projects. And I, I want to say again that the actual software uh, back end, the simulation, is not the biggest part of these kinds of projects. The biggest part is presentation and designing of, of exercises. And Giuliano will be uh, presenting how to upload uh, NanoHub apps. I think on the 25th of October, he'll be teaching that. And uh, also, instead of an exam, I believe, Giuliano, you can confirm, I think we have uh, a group from Eli Lilly coming to talk about pharmacokinetic modeling. Yep, on the 25th. And, and that will be in person only, is that correct? Um, it cannot be broadcast to YouTube or be saved for later. Um, I think Zoom is fine, but I need to double check. Okay, so please check with that. And then they wanted two hours, so maybe you could do the upload yep. instructions yep. for NanoHub on the same day. I think that's much more interesting than an exam, unless people feel a, 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 a pressing desire to have an exam on the 25th of October. I think it might be more useful to hear an industrial perspective on this kind of modeling uh, and to learn how to do uploads. Any questions about that so far? Next week will be online only because I'm going to be traveling I'm going to be in Vancouver. And if if it's all if it's in person only on the twenty fifth, Juliana will give you plenty of warning. So I'd like to go over something that I did, as I say, individually with uh, most people in the class. Uh, but I'd like people to follow along. I'm going to walk you through the slide deck, and then we can do a demo together. I thought it worked pretty well. Uh, instead of using a split screen in my typing to walk you through the steps, have you do it. Uh, so you'll need a browser open on your computer. And I would ask you to do this as an exercise. I'd like to talk about uh, downloading SPML models from biomodels and converting them to antimony, uh, which is of course the language we're using. Uh, systems biology markup language is a model uh, specification standard. Uh, it's the most widely used model specification standard for network models. Uh, if you want to know a bit about the history and how it works, uh, there's a chapter in Herbert's textbook on it, which is very good. It's not one of the ones I'm assigning because we're not uh, really going to be focusing on the language standard. Uh, but Herbert Sauer, who wrote the textbook, was one of the prime developers of SPML. Uh, but SPML is what's called an exchange language. It's designed for computers to read, like PostScript. It's not really designed for humans to read. You can read it, but it's cumbersome, which is why we use antimony. Typically, when people are using uh, SPML, they will use a, uh, a model editor. And there are a lot of nice model editors available. Copazi. Cell designer and so on. Uh, but the one problem with that then is that you always have to have a specific tool uh, to see and run your model uh, as opposed to 
antimony, which you load into regular Python and run. And so the one thing that we're going to have to do is see how to convert uh, archived models written in SPML into antimony. It's only a few lines. Uh, many of you have seen this already, um, but uh, it's a pretty easy process. I want to go over it with you uh, so that you can be comfortable with it in the future. As I mentioned, I noticed that the, the syntax that's in the cheat sheets is out of date. And so, Giuliano, we need to update those cheat sheets to reflect the current syntax. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to find go to BioModels, which is a big, there are many places you could find SPML models, but the biggest repository of them is the BioModels database. Uh, we'll look at that. We'll see how to search in that. Uh, we'll see how to manipulate uh, that. And I'll ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to fire up a browser and follow along and do these step by step as we walk through it. Uh, then we'll download a model and then we'll upload it to NanoHub and we'll open it in Tellurium and convert it to Anemone and run it. And then you can do something fancy to save it as an Anemone model, but the easiest thing to do is just cut and paste it uh, and you can save it as an Anemone model. Fancier things work fine if you want to do that, but you don't need them. So step one, we'll call this exercise 6.1 for today, uh, is uh, downloading SPML models from BioModels database. And so I would like everybody to go to the uh, BioModels database. Um, it's uh, www.ebi.ac.uk slash uh, biomodels. If you search uh, EBIs and biomodels in Google, you should find it immediately. And so let me give everybody a minute uh, to find to find that uh, web page. Thank you for putting that in the chat. Does so everybody have that? If anybody needs more time, speak up. Okay. And you'll see on Biomodels webpage at the top, there is a search bar. And in that search bar, I want you to type uh, EGFR, capital E, capital G, capital F, capital R, and then hit the, the search button. So everybody got that? So when you do that, it will pull up a, a window that will have a list of models. It's possible that for your search term, there will be nothing. Uh, it's possible that for your search term, there will be a lot. And if there's a lot, you need to look down at the bottom uh, right-hand corner of that response box and there's a little bit of page one, page two, page three information, uh, which I've highlighted with the number one here. Uh, and you can scroll through that and see what the models are. And what you'll see here is a list of models. Each one of these models is a system biology markup language network kinetics model. Actually, some of them are not kinetic. They're only network architecture, but in general, they're kin network models. Uh, and they're typically tagged by the uh, name of the paper, the author name of the paper that they come from. So we see here Shin underscore 2016 is the uh, last name of the first author, the year of the paper, and then a description of the model. And in the case of EGFR, there are quite a few models. Uh, you'll notice that there may be multiple models uh, from the same paper. So you have to do maybe a little bit of digging to uh, find out which one is which. And so I would ask you to click on the link and we're going to do Bianconi 2012. 
which is in the middle of the page. So does everybody have that uh, available to them? If anybody's having trouble, speak up. So click on that blue link for Bianconi 2012. And again, we can do this together uh, with a screen share, but I thought since this, the fonts are a little bit small, it would be, if I then screen share, split the screen to do this, it's hard to see. Does anybody need more time for that? Okay. So when you click on that, it will open up a page that describes the resource. And by default, it will go to overview. And you will see at the top a short description, which is fundamentally an abstract of what the model is about. Very often, that abstract is copied from the paper directly. Sometimes it's written separately. Uh, below it, you will see a link uh, to the paper. And so if you click. Uh, on the bottom, where you have the name of the paper, computational model of EGFR and IGF one uh, R pathways. If you click there, that will take you to the paper. Sometimes you'll have to click a second time to get the full text. Sometimes that will take you to something which has the abstract only, and you may have to then look for the full text. Um, there'll be a bunch of documentation here on the right, which is metadata information uh, about the publication. It says something like curated. Curated means that somebody actually checked to make sure the model works, uh, which is nice. They did that by hand. And there could be other information that's available too. Uh, you'll see that there are a number of tabs at the top um, the ones you're going to care about are overview and files, primarily uh, history, components, and curation are more about uh, how that, uh, that model was established. The other feature, which is sort of nice, and I'll ask you to try now, is if you look down on the bottom right, where it says connected external resources, which I've numbered with two, there's a little picture of a network. And I would like everybody to click on that picture and tell me what they find. What happens when you click on that picture? So, I mean, there's a chemical reaction diagram. Um, the notation of it is a little bit different than the notation that we've been discussing though. Like I'm assuming normal arrows are still material flow and I'm guessing that the big squares are chemical reactions and the tiny squares are some type of regulatory aspect, but I'm not, that's how I would read it at a first pass. Right, right. so, so I, I certainly wouldn't say that this tool is necessarily the best tool available uh, for editing networks. Um, You'll see that it's a it's a it's a web tool for network editing, and uh, it gives you a bunch of options for changing the visualization. You can relay things out and so on. Um, so in principle, you could go to that tool and draw a network pathway by yourself. I haven't worked with it. Uh, I've got a list of, of network layout tools uh, that's in the uh, student resources folder. Uh, if you're interested, I suspect people will be. There are a variety of them. I, I personally think uh, cell designers got good layout capability, but it's convenient to have things online. The main thing that I'm suggesting here is not so much that you're going to use these networks by themselves, but at least, and often they give you a hairball. They don't give you anything terribly useful, but at least you can see that what the network looks like a little bit. Um, of course, if you go into the paper, presumably it'll show you what the network diagram is, but uh, this is a quick way to see, does the network have the components I want? Is it of the complexity I want and so on? Um, and I'd encourage you to try playing with it and see whether this network editor is something you like. Uh, it uses this SVGN uh, notation um, 
as it's uh, for the arrows and, and boxes. Uh, and that's a little bit different from the standard notation that we've been developing, as you point out, Connor. Uh, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is a replacement for other tools, but I think it's, it's worth knowing about. Uh, in particular, if you're on a page like this and you want to say, do I want to go any further with this model? Uh, a click there and just looking at the network and saying, does this make any sense to me? Maybe all the components are things I'm not interested in because the network itself is not visualized on this home page. So if you want to see anything about what the network components are, you have to you have to either go to the paper, which takes a little bit more work, or click on that. Any other questions about that so far? And this is my I had the comment that that the format is a little ugly. I'm not I'm not it's not beautiful. Okay. So here's what you'll see for format, and you'll see there's a variety of palettes for drawing things. In principle, you could relay things out, you can drag things and so on. Uh, if you want to uh, see the paper, uh, you could click on the paper. Uh, that should open it up, usually in PubMed. Uh, if it's in PubMed, sometimes you have to click on that get full text uh, box uh, to be able to see the full text of the paper. But the good news is if you see that network show up in that online editor, you know there actually is a network there for you to download. That's the main thing. Okay. So um, the next thing that you have to do, and again, I realize that this is a lot of steps, but once you've done it once or twice, it's not so bad. The next thing you have to do is go back to that page with the model, and I'd ask you to do that, and then click on the File tab. So the first tab was Overview. Now click on File. And it'll pull up a bunch of uh, information. It'll call, say Model Files, and then it'll say Additional Files. And most of those additional files are, are, are exports of the base model into other formats. Uh, the one you're going to want 99% of the time is the one that's listed as model file. And so I would like everybody to hit the download button next to that first model, BioMC000. Okay. And I'll give people a minute to make sure that everybody got that. Did that work for people? Depending on whether you're at Mac, PC, Linux, uh, the download may put it in a different place. You want to keep track of where you put it. Did anybody have any trouble getting it to download? Speak up. If, if, if. Connor, did that work for you? Yep, I've got it downloaded. Great. Anybody else have problems? Okay. All right. So now I'd like everybody to fire up Tellurium on NanoHub. If you want to do, if you have Tellurium on your desktop and you want to run it on desktop, that's fine too. Uh, you'll save a second or two by, by that. So I'll give people a second to get Tellurium running on NanoHub. And once you have Tellurium running on NanoHub, go to the file menu, select open, hit upload, Point to the file you've just downloaded to your local computer and hit upload again. Don't open the file once it's uploaded. Just, 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 uh, just upload it so it's available to you in your in your scratch space on Nano. And you're going to need that file name, so you could copy the file name to your clipboard if you like. You know, go back and forth here. Yeah. 
So I'll give people a second to do that. Anybody need more time? I know getting NanoHub started sometimes takes a little while, so I don't want to rush people. Everybody okay on that? All right. So the next step, actually the first thing to do is in Tellurium, since you're gonna to wanna to save your output, and since the default when you open a Tellurium Jupyter Notebook is that it's not editable, uh, so go to uh, your file menu and, and do a new new notebook, Python 3 notebook. And that, that's, a, that's a bug in the installed version of Tellurium on NanoHub, and I'm continually apologizing for that, but uh, that's what we have. Okay. And then you need to try three lines. Uh, the first line is your usual import to learn is TE. The second line would be R equals TE dot load SPML model. And then as an argument, put the name of the file you just uploaded. And that will load the, the uh, SPML model, <coughs> parse it, and save it into that object R. And you can then execute that model directly from SPML if you like. Uh, it'll run uh, just to the way you, an antimony model would run. The only problem with doing it that way is you can't see the model. Although there are now some uh, visualization and editing tools uh, in Tellurium for, for looking at models. And if you're interested in those, you can look at the online documentation. But for our purposes, since we're focusing on antimony modeling here in class, we're going to convert that SPML model to antimony. And one of the great things about SPML is it's, uh, because it's an exchange language, it can be converted automatically. And so there is a function uh, built into Tellurium called get antimony uh, that will convert any model that you've loaded into uh, antimony. And so type uh, here, we could call it antimony model, could just be model or some, some any character, any, any handle you like except R if you use it for the other one. Uh, antimony model equals r dot get antimony. And then we'll print what we got. And so I'd like everybody to do that. And I'll wait for people to see what happened. But if, you're, if everything is going well, it should have printed a listing of the model uh, converted from SPML to Atomon. Now, depending on how uh, the, the original model was created, uh, the Atomoni model may look very pretty. In this case, it looks quite nice. Uh, in some cases, it will have uh, formatting issues like no carriage returns or additional uh, metadata that looks sort of ugly, but but here the model looks fine. Now I could uh, type that antimony model to a file if I wanted to. Uh, I think the easiest thing to do uh, to save it is to just say uh, create a, 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 a string. So string equals triple quotes so that you can have carriage returns, uh, go into the window where you've pasted, where you've had the print and uh, select the model. And select all doesn't work inside of Jupyter Notebook cells. You have to actually physically scroll uh, to do your selection, but just go through the cell 
from the top in the where and do you printed from the top to the bottom, select the output, copy it, paste it into your new cell. Uh, so now you have your antimony model equals triple quotes, and then the output that we just created from those three lines. And now you can hit the save button and you've got a saved copy of your antimony model. So in principle, now you could do, get rid of that line one and line line in cell two and that other line one uh, and just load the antimony model that you've got here. So you've now gone through the steps of finding a model online in SPML format, downloading it to your desktop, pulling it onto NanoHub and converting it from SPML to antimony and saving it as an antimony model. Did that work for everybody? Did anybody have problems with that? So I'm switching. I'm I'm trying to do it in both Nano Hub and locally. If I do it locally, do I need to do the file path where the file name would be? Or yes, probably. Okay. Yes, or or you put in the same file or folder. Okay. Okay. One of the two. Yeah, I did it. I mean. For I, I did it online partly because partly because not everybody has a local copy and partly because the, the working directory, the way to learn is set up online on NanoHub, it automatically puts everything into its current working directory. That that can be a bit of a problem if you're trying to have multiple directories and working with them. But but uh, as a default, it's pretty easy. Did anybody not get the model uploaded or not get it to convert? As I mentioned, the syntax uh, TE load model, load SPML model and uh, get antimony uh, is slightly different in the, uh, in the cheat sheets. It reflects an older, older version of Tellurium from the one we're working with now. The command names are there, but the, but the call is slightly different. And I need to update that. So did everybody get that to work? Okay. So the next thing to do is to run it, see if it worked. So now create a cell below what you did, do an r.simulate. We don't know what the time scale is, so we'll just guess and say 10, whatever that is. Uh, do a thousand time points and then do an r.plot. And, and of course, if this were a random model online and you tried to do this, the likelihood when you load that model and try to run it is it'll crash. Uh, so here in this case, at least when I do it, it runs. And that to me is actually pretty impressive because the vast majority of published models, even when they give you computer code, don't work. Uh, and here we didn't really have to do much of anything and it worked. Uh, and it happens that a time of 10 is about right for this particular model, uh, but depending on what the model is, I could have to change that. Now, now one problem here is when I use that bare plot function, it plots all of the variables and puts a key on top of it and there a lot of variables and, and uh, the key overlays a lot. And so if I were going to work with this model, I probably wouldn't want to plot everything at once. I probably want to use plot array function or some other matplotlib function. Uh, but at least this shows that you actually got it to work. So maybe just have a sort of a hands show of hands. How many people got it to work? Great. If anybody who didn't get it to work. If it worked for everybody, that's actually pretty impressive because I know it may not sound like much, but actually getting getting models to be able to be downloaded and run uh, reliably is, is not trivial. All right, so you can now download and convert an archived SPML model. And as I mentioned, 
if you hit the save and checkpoint under file menu and then hit download, you've now got a local copy of the antimony model version of your report. So my next little exercise is asking everybody to take a few minutes and do something for yourself. So I'd ask you to go back to that biomodels homepage and search for a model uh, that you're interested in. And I'm not telling you how to do it. You could type in cancer, you could type in stem cell, you could type in RAC or RO or AMPA uh, or something else. And so uh, depending maybe on your project or your research area, you type, pick a, pick a topic, uh, go to the page, uh, which lists the options. Uh, pick one of the uh, models there, go to that page, download the SPML from the file tab, and then uh, use what the, the sequence of events that we did before to upload the model and uh, convert it to antimony. You can keep the code that you've just used. You don't have to retype the command uh, and then run it and see whether it works. So I give everybody a, a minute or two to try that. And then uh, I'd like to find out first what model people picked. Uh, secondly, why you picked it. There isn't a right or wrong answer, but I'd just be interested. Uh, and then when you tried to upload it and run it, did it run? And what did you see? And if people want to uh, screen share their results, uh, that would be fine. I don't want to put too many people on the spot, but it would be nice to, to get a sense of, of the variety of things. Uh, that biomodels database is pretty good, uh, but it's, it's dependent on people being willing to put the stuff in the archive, which takes work. And so uh, for some topics, there are quite a few models available. For other topics, there may not be anything, or there might be only one. Uh, and there are a few models in that database which are structural models only. They have the network without the kinetics. Uh, SBML allows you to draw the network without having the rate laws to be able to execute it. And so uh, I suppose that if you were unlucky, you could have downloaded a model that only had the, the architecture of the network. And then when you tried to load it, it would convert to antimony, but there would be no rate laws. Uh, and uh, when you tried to run it, nothing would happen or it would crash. So I'll give people a few minutes to try that out. And when you've got something, let me know and we'll see how that, how that works. Maybe people, let me see, I can see if I can see the, the way my screens are configured this isn't so, so convenient. I see Connor there. If people, if people can uh, maybe raise a hand in the Zoom when they're ready, uh, I know it'll take a few minutes to, to you're done, Eden, or, or is that a question? No, I've, I've got a graph. All right. Uh, Anybody else ready? I know this may take a few minutes to, to, to decide what you're going to search for and then uh, download it and upload it again. Uh, so I'll give people another minute or two. Anybody else? We'll wait till a couple of people have it. But I would like everybody to do this. Uh, uh, Lindsay, you found one that doesn't work. Good job. <laughs> Gabriel, yours doesn't work either, huh? Well, maybe we have to look at them together. It's interesting, uh, the, the, the demo that we picked uh, for the other course, for my spring course, um, 
they wound up that that they that that model doesn't run either. There's a bug in it. Uh, okay, you got a weird plot. That's a little different. If the model executes, uh, but the plot looks strange, that that's uh, that maybe is a bit. So if you're working on it, let's keep working on it. Uh, Eden, do you want to show us what you got? Sure. There to go, hang on. Yeah, we don't have to have absolutely everybody do it, but it's sort of fun to see what people pick. Okay. So, so tell us what the model is. And, and So here's the paper. Um, I honestly looked under Xenopus and organisms under the filters and picked one accordingly. Um, so I'm not quite sure what cascade we're looking at. Um, but the model seemed to load OK. That's map kinase. That's one of the classic... Uh, phosphorylation cascade signaling reaction. Okay. And then the, the simulation seemed to run okay. Okay. As far as I can uh, tell. I'm not really sure what the species are, but. All right, so, so, so you're, you're at the mercy of the person who created the model. Right. So if they, if they gave you species names like map kinase, 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 or map kinase, then you'd have some idea if they name your species, species one, species two, species three, then you're you're sort of uh, you're sort of stuck. You have to go back and look at them. Um, what you could see if we look at the at the at the uh, SBML code, if you scroll up, if you scroll up to the top, there you go. Stop there for a second. The first thing you'll you'll see is something called compartments. And, and uh, we haven't talked about compartments, um, but in principle, you might have uh, one set of network models that run inside the cytoplasm of your cell, another that represent what's going on outside the cell, or one set of models, that set, set of ODEs that represent what's going on in the nucleus, and one set that represent what's going on in the cytoplasm. And so uh, in those cases, you might draw a box around them and call it a compartment. In particular, if you're going to inter if you're going to convert uh, concentrations of chemicals to amounts or vice versa, you need to know uh, what the volume you're talking about is. If you want to, if you have a concentration, you want to know how many molecules you have. Uh, it's n molar solution, and you want to know how many molecules you have. Then you have to know the volume you're talking about, and vice versa. Uh, some species like to use absolute uh, numbers of molecules. Others Others use concentrations. And so compartments are, are a concept that's supported in antimony and SPML uh, that we're not going to play with much uh, in this class. Uh, we don't really need it, but it's there. Are the pharmacokinetic models all compartment oriented a lot Pretty of the time? Much, yeah. Okay. So pharmacokinetics almost always are talking about actual amounts uh, because, because uh, the volumes of, of, say, your liver or your kidneys or your heart are quite different. And so uh, if you give a, a, a dose of a molecule and you want to know how much of that molecule is getting into different tissues, you do have to know how big the volumes are. Uh, so that the pharmacokinetic models almost always have compartments, yes. Um, then we have a list of reactions. And... Uh, Actually, it looks like the species names are pretty, are, are descriptive there. Um, so that looks okay. Uh, sometimes you'll also see uh, function definitions uh, or uh, uh, dynamic assignments, which we haven't really talked about yet. Um, then you have your initial conditions. You'll notice that um, one thing that you may notice is that you can define units. There was a good question last week about what are the units of time? And I said, in this case, we didn't define them, but, but uh, antimony lets you say uh, time units are minutes, time units are seconds, or 
concentration units are moles. Um, and so very often in SBML models, you'll see that the units of uh, parameters and variables are, are in fact specified. Uh, here, um, doesn't look like they are. Um, and then uh, where compartmental initialization means that they just set the volume of the compartment to one, so they're not really using it. And then we can scroll down a little bit. Uh, so the constant uh, is like the dollar sign. It, it fixes the value of the species. Uh, here, so display names. Um, is supposed to be making things more intelligible. Uh, something that we're, we're which, which uh, if you were going to use things in, in say, pharma, are quite important, is that when you give a species name, or more, especially for a drug, you need to make sure that you actually, when you know what it is. And so uh, that CV terms allows you to connect the name of your species, your, your variable name, which is arbitrary to some extent, to an actual reference, an official reference, uh, an online dictionary that says, this is this chemical. And so that's what's going on there under CV terms. And uh, uh, the rest of the, the, I actually don't know what that, uh, Looks like a version history there, maybe. I don't, I, that, that's the, that I don't know. That's syntax I don't know. We find a model with something I don't know. Uh, and uh, gives you some additional annotation. Okay. And so now when you run it, I actually don't understand why the species names are being replaced by species one, species two, species three. You got me on that one, because uh, it looks like the, they're, they're, the species are actually named in the uh, in the uh, in the reaction. And so I'm not sure why they're why they're being. Uh... Oh, there it is. Okay, so okay, so. So my guess is actually, if you deleted that first thing, which said species, species, that it probably would work. And then you'd see the value, you'd actually see the, uh, you'd actually see the uh, things you want, but I, I can't promise you on that. Okay. Does somebody else want it? You could try that. Does that somebody else want to try show something else off? Somebody said it failed. Does anybody want to show a failure? I don't want to take too much time on this, but I think it's it's nice to be able to do this. I mean, mine looks weird. I can show that. Sure. Take a look. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. So this was the. Um, this is why I decided to share. Uh, decided to pick. Yeah. Um, I don't really know too much about it, but it's just neural cell, stem cell differentiation model. And this is what I ended up with, was this. <laughs> okay. So. It's kind of flat. <laughs> And so I'm not quite sure what. Um... It, it's flat because you have one parameter that is 100 and the other ones are below 10. Uh, oh, but it, wor but it yeah. works. No, I'm, I'm aware of that. I just don't know how to fix it. You <laughs> to probably need to, to use adjust the, the height to make yeah. it more clear. You probably need to use a different plot, which is the matplotlib. And then you set the size of the picture for you. So they, then you can see better. Yeah. Another, another thing to do would be to select which columns to output. Remember, mm. we, 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 we said when you do simulate, you can select which columns to output, or you could put do your result and then pull the columns from that and plot. 
only the ones you care about. Um, okay. But but it looks uh, it, it runs. Yeah. Just it doesn't <laughs> crash. Uh, yeah. Again, the names of the species are not very informative. Uh, but if I look at the reactions, it looks like they really aren't. In other words, uh, mm -hmm. the reaction names are all uh, just uh, just um, numbered. Yeah. Which which may be which may mean that the, that those uh, those ODEs were actually generated by computer. They may have been generated automatically. Uh, but yeah, so there you've got display names. But clearly, that display name isn't working for the isn't working for that that default plot function. Uh, but you could you could use that. Um, if you were using a plot plot array or something like that to do it, or if you want, if you were, if you wanted to, you could go in by hand and substitute nucleus for C one and so on. Mm. I'm not guaranteeing that you never have to edit your your model. Uh, uh, the point is more that you can pull a model in and and, and get it to to run without having to retype everything. Right. So. So I'd agree. I think I think here, probably defining the Y scale would be the place to start with this, or else just figure out which is the offending one that's too big and, and not displayed. But that's great. Maybe not actually. What do you mean, Connor? I no, sorry. I was. I said I found a model that worked. I thought in response to people saying they didn't, but now I'm realizing that. I think that there's a species in the antimony model that just kind of goes to infinity and I'm trying to look at their paper and see if that's supposed to happen or not. Um, it looks like it's supposed to plateau in their paper. Well, well, one thing that can happen a lot is that if you have a constant production of a molecule, then uh, that one species will diverge. And so if you plot We've seen this before in some of the things we did in class, where you had an enzymatic reaction and the product is continually being produced. And so if you plot the, the amount of product, it will dominate the plot. And so you don't, don't display the amount of product, or you display the rate of production of product rather than the amount. So uh, again, uh, you, you do have to, I mean, Sometimes these things work out of the box. Uh, sometimes you have to think a little bit about them. Uh, but the, 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 the point more is just that you, you have here, if it happens to be something you're interested in, I know, for example, that, that uh, Joel is interested in, in signaling pathways involving sonic hedgehog, EGF, uh, and some of the other, and notch. And so the, the, the uh, the circuit that you found here and showing us now uh, has all of those species in it. So maybe this is one that, that Joel should be looking at for his work. Yeah, I got one with notch too here. I looked in, in the notch one. But yeah, if you can share with me, Zach, the link, I would appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Does anybody I'll else want to show a, Does anybody else want to show a, 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 either a success or a failure? If you want to do one here in, in, in the room, that works too, if anybody. Uh, I have one that I'm not sure what exactly it's saying. But this is supposed to be coffee's pharmacokinetics and resistance to whatever the pressure effect is. Well, it's a, you got an oscillatory one. That's nice. Yep. Uh, I know there are a bunch of neural, neural firing ones in there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I think the pink one is the caffeine itself. So cup of coffee and stabilizes. And I think this is days, but I'm not sure. That looks like so. This is a dose response model, basically. Yep. Boy, caffeine takes a long time to accumulate in your body, huh? Well, it is. Yeah. So 
Juliana, for this model, is the coffee in because that looks like it's going up. Is that is that receiving feedback from? Yeah, I haven't looked into whatever is in here, uh, but I think that gray is resistance to whatever presser effect is. Uh, this is uh, so. so Actually, I'm not sure. Well, the one thing I can say is that the orange curve is the is the is the dose, because that yes. spikes up and then decays exponentially. Yes. Yeah. So this. Yeah. CP. Oh yeah. Because they have two things called CP, and CP is coffee cup or something like that. Maybe like caffeine, per but. Wait, I'm if there's if there, why are there two variables named CP with different curves? That's probably caffeine plasma level. Yes, probably. Um, so one is probably in your gut, and one is in your blood. Yep. Oh, okay. It was confusing me because so sh I shouldn't read this as square bracket. This concentration and non-square brackets are something. Yeah. Else? Well, we can look at the model together and see. Uh, yeah, so this is a PBBK, so it has more than one compartment. Wait, what? I think if you print the antimony, it's easier to read. Yep. What was the print again? Oh, um, so you have to convert it, you mean? Yep. So, so uh, get, it's get antimony. Demo case? Uh, yeah. R equals get, R dot get antimony. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, plasma compartments and other thing. Oh, so this one has events in it, right? So yes. this has yes. a dosing event. Uh, I think it's sort of sweet to have a coffee cup as a unit in a, in a bottle. Yep. So you could change how many cups you drink at a time, how big they are. Yeah, T lag. That's the thing. Change your body weight. Yep. Yeah. Seems to have everything in one. And here are their units, right? Here, here it gives you time the time and units of hours and and. Uh, yeah, the time unit is six hours. No, it's one hour, one hour. Yeah, one hour, yep. So poor subjects were having to drink coffee every two and a half hours. Yeah. With... No, give me a week. That, that sometimes help. Yeah, but- uh, For a heart attack? One, yes. Okay, anybody else will do maybe one more up one more opportunity if somebody else wants to show what they got. I don't want to spend it's fun. I don't want to spend all day on it either, but but it's uh, I think it's nice to see that people have come up with some interesting models. I think there I don't remember exactly how many models there are on the database, about a thousand, I think. There, there actually are, are a lot more than that, but a lot of them are automatically generated and aren't that really aren't that good. So you want to do anybody else want to show off what they got? If somebody had a failure, we could look at that. 
Mine wasn't a failure. I figured out what it was showing, so. I mean, if you want to see, it would be a really fast, <laughs> just. Sure. Message. Okay. Um, so that was the one that works. This one, yeah, basically just at the level of the load SBML model, it said that this global parameter was something. Um, assignment rules. Okay, so that really is, that's a bug in the model. Um, so at least it's giving it a formative error. <laughs> and so what you would have to then do that would be to uh, go into the paper and see what the value of that PKAC underscore I is. Um, maybe let's look at the, let's this look at the uh, your listing and see if we can find that uh, PKAC P -K -A -C underscore I in your code and see what, what happened to it. Okay. Um, so you said the paper, so it would be. No, well, let's just start with the, let's just start with the antimony. So in, in your, in your, in your execution, mm. in, your, in, in your nano hub, uh, find the, okay, where did you, where you load, where you loaded it, you loaded it. And it, oh, you, yeah. oh it crashed when you loaded the SPML model. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, she has to open the SPML and add it there, but that's even harder. I mean, yeah. So that this is this that's is the problem. only way. <laughs> I, I I misunderstood. I thought it was crashing when you were converting it to Atomon. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> it's actually crashing. So that means that means that there's actually a bug in the SPML. And so mm -hmm. now, if you go back to the page, the the page where it was sourced, so go back to the page where you found it there. Um, you'll notice under in the right hand corner where it says curation status non curated. Mm -hmm. That means nobody checked that it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in principle, you could report this and tell them that it doesn't work, that there's a bug in it. Um, so, so just because it's in the database, unfortunately, doesn't mean it'll work. More likely to work. But remember what I said about you know, most published models, even if there's code, they don't work. So, so here you found a model, even if it's in the database, it's supposed to work, it doesn't work. Um, and the problem with SPML, again, is, is the one that I mentioned, and which, which Joel alluded to, which is that you can't edit it by hand. In principle, you could, but it's a pain. And so then you'd have to get a, a model editing tool like, like uh, Cell Designer or Copazi, pull the model into that, find that missing piece, fix it, and then save it again and, and edit it. And so again, this is why I like Antimony because everything is there to look at. You don't need a fancy editor. You can edit it as text. Whereas SPML, you have to edit through a model editor. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you picked one that doesn't work. On the other hand, I think it's great that that people get to see that. Yes, I'm have a knack for picking ones that don't work. I tried actually two of them. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I mean, it can fail at different steps. In other words, you could you it could fail. Yours is failing when you load the SPML. It means there's actually syntax error in the SPML. Uh, it could fail when you convert it to Anemone because some S fancy SPML features aren't implemented in Anemone. Or it could convert to Anemone and then when you run it, it crashes. So, so in principle, it could fail at any of those steps. Great. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, I think this was a good demo. I'm not, I'm not trying to cut people off, but if, if somebody has something they want to show, that's great. If not, if not, I think we can move on. So I, I think that I, 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 in a sense, I regret not doing this earlier because when people were looking for papers, uh, we had that list of papers, uh, but some of the people found really interesting papers with 300 equations, which they'd have to retype by hand. 
And so, uh, especially for complicated models, your life is a lot easier if it's downloadable. Even if it's got a bug in it, it may be easier to fix the, the, the pre-typed one than to try to retype everything from scratch. And so, uh, this is a resource that people might want to take advantage. Certainly, if you're going to be using SPM, if you're going to be using this kind of modeling in the future in biology, uh, being aware of this is important. And, and the flip side is when you publish, if you publish models in Atomony or SPML, uh, I encourage you to upload them to, to this repository. It's, it, the field has uh, really, one nice thing about this field is that, that that is by far the dominant place to put uh, models of this kind. Okay. Other comments or questions? Yeah, please. Uh, that's a good question. I didn't. The question was in, in Appendix H in the in the in the textbook. It lists some other databases besides uh, biomodels. Uh, as sources, and I don't remember what they are. Does anybody have the the uh, Appendix H page they could screen share? Um, if you give me two seconds, I can pull it up. There certainly there certainly are other databases of, of network models. Um, the, the one thing about the, the this one, the biomodels one, is that they require everything to be in SPML. Um, some of the other databases, it could be in MATLAB, it could be in C++ or something else. Um, this is what you were looking for, right? So was there a particular, was there a particular list of, uh, was there something else that you? There's the databases part here. Okay. okay, so JSIM, actually, actually poor Jim Bassingway died in the spring. So JSIM was, uh, I think Jim Bassingway's um, modeling environment. He developed a network modeling package long ago, long before SPML and everything else. Uh, and I'm pretty sure JSIM was his uh, his project. Um, having trouble loading it. Is, has it been taken down since he passed? I don't. I don't know. Okay, I'll give it a second to load in the corner. Uh, but uh, and the JWS, nope. I don't. Yeah, no, I think that may be gone. That's unfortunate. Uh, and uh, JWS, I actually don't know. Um, and then they mentioned the DOQCS uses Genesis. So that would be for, um, for neural network models. But they're not interconvertible, so you're stuck. So basically, basically, um, uh, the answer is that there aren't, really aren't that many databases that have uh, shareable models. Uh, the the one that he has here is 101. I don't know. It, the, <laughs> he has it as an index, but he doesn't give the give, doesn't give the uh, URL for it. Uh, but if you search cell ML, you'll find it. And, and cell ML is loadable. Just the way we loaded SPML, cell ML is another model specification standard. So, so Tellurium allows you to load a cell ML model and do exactly what we did for SPML. Uh, so, so any models that were there would be usable. Um, in general, uh, cell ML and SPML were competing standards. Uh, they were developed about the same time. And for a long time, the world was more or less 50-50 cell ML, SPML. I'd say in the past five years, uh, probably 90% of ongoing efforts are in SPML. 
Um, but they are interconvertible. So, so uh, anything, if you find a model in cell ML that you want to use, you can do that. Um, JSIM, JSIM didn't, I don't think had an exporter. That's, that's the one. Uh, so, so the answer really, what Herbert is saying is there should be more databases than there are. Uh, so that was a good question. I wish, I wish the answer were there were lots of them and there was lots of additional material, but, but the issue is primarily that, that actually uploading the data, uploading the uh, model with the standard annotation formats is a fair amount of work. And so a lot of people don't do it. Uh, I noticed this, I noticed this when I was talking with some of the students in the past few days about their projects, which is that, that, that modern uh, best practice is that when you publish a paper with a model, uh, at the very minimum, you should have the code that generated it. Even if it's C++ code or Fortran code or MATLAB code, you should publish the code. And, and I was a little bit shocked actually that, that uh, people were finding papers that were published in res respectable journals where there was no code. And so that meant that if you wanted to replicate that work, uh, you'd have to reinvent the simulations by hand. And uh, these days actually NIH, the National Institutes of Health are now demanding that everything be published with the code. Um, but it is work. As, as Giuliano will tell you, uh, preparing code for distribution is a lot of work. Uh, so uh, if you publish in a journal like PLOS Computational Biology, they'll ask you to pub definitely to distribute the code and it's quite a bit of work to do. But science depends on the ability to reproduce and, and, and reuse. And so if you have models that aren't, aren't published, then it's a problem. All very good points. Anything else to discuss about databases? And if somebody finds an interesting database we don't know about, send it to me and send it to Herbert. One of the nice things about Herbert's textbook is that it's in LaTeX and Overleaf and uh, it's printed on demand. And so if you send a correction to him, he can put the correction in the, in the textbook right away. And then everybody who buys the textbook after that gets the correction. So uh, it's a live document and he does support that particular textbook pretty well. So uh, I won't guarantee that he'd incorporate your improvements immediately, but in general, uh, when you catch mistakes in the book and send them to him, he does include them. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope that was helpful for people. Um, as I say, I know I went over some of this before with individual groups, but I thought it would be fun to do it as a group. Uh, and I think it's interesting to see what, what people came up with. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see that some models fail. I know the I know that the one that the one that uh, the one that um, the one that uh, we used to use for uh, the one that we used to use for our demo for the other for the spring class, the Tyson model fails because it has uh, parameters that have to be provided from outside. So it won't run as a freestanding model. So that, that can help. All right. So I just want to remind you of some things that we did last time. It may seem, seem like the distant past, uh, but it came up a little bit in the homework. Uh, and maybe the wording in the homework wasn't so clear. When I ask people uh, for the uh, steady state value of a, of a variable versus a parameter, and a lot of people did, uh, a lot of people plotted uh, parameter scans. And in general, I didn't take anything off if you did this, 
they did parameter scans, but they didn't plot uh, a plot where the x-axis was the parameter and the y-axis was the steady state value. And I remind you that uh, we discussed how to do that. Here I'm using the get steady state value function. Uh, I warn you again that that can crash, in which case you simply need to run the r.simulate uh, for a long time until you reach equilibrium. Slower, but it's more reliable. Um, but here we create an empty array uh, with two columns using that rather awkward numpy empty command. And then we scan here the parameter S. Uh, we change the value of S in the simulation. We get what the equilibrium value here of the rate of production of P is. Um, and then we stack um, S comma that, and that'll give us a plot, which is the rate of production of P as a function of S. And so that was actually what I was hoping for uh, in the uh, in the homework that was due, that people did this past week. Uh, and I, I don't think most people didn't do that. Uh, maybe that maybe the problem wasn't clear. We hadn't discussed this uh, little um, code snippet in class. I know. Uh, but we did at the end of class last time do this. And what we saw here was something that I want to come uh, spend some of the rest of the class on, uh, which is we have a plot here of the uh, rate of production of product as a function of the concentration of substrate. And uh, in class last time, we went over the homework problem where we had a, a qualitative question, which was, how does such and such depend on such and such? And in this case, the, the question could be, how does the rate of production of the product depend on the concentration of the substrate? And what you see, if you look at this curve, is that the rate of production of product uh, is zero if there's no substrate. It makes sense. If there's nothing to react, you don't get it. Uh, but the rate of increase of production is maximal for small concentrations of substrate. And then as the concentration of substrate gets large, uh, if I went to a big enough value of S, I'd see that the rate of production becomes essentially independent of the amount of substrate. And the reason that would happen is that I would be what is called enzyme limited. Uh, if the amount of S that I have is much, much bigger than the amount of enzyme, all of my enzyme is tied up in the complex ES. And so the rate of production of uh, P is limited by the amount of enzyme, amount of E, not by the amount of S. And this functional form, which is monotonically increasing, zero at zero, uh, slope maximal at zero, uh, value uh, slope going to zero as uh, the argument gets large, uh, is called the michaelis menten uh, law. And uh, I was going to do a little, I have a slide deck that does derivations for this. And, and we'll see, I, I may go through this a little bit quickly because I'd like to cover some other things. Um, you could definitely look up the michaelis menten derivation uh, in online. Wikipedia has a good derivation of it. The textbook that I, I recommended on Math Bio has it. Uh, Herbert has it in that appendix. So it's, you can find it in a variety of places. Uh, but let's, uh, let's, sorry, let's, let's think about this for a second. So uh, when we did this as a simulation uh, uh, a while ago, we found that if uh, we had a lot of substrate, uh, and the rate of production of product was small, uh, then the, uh, we were basically not changing the amount of ES uh, because we, we had plenty of substrate. And so the rate of production of, of product was essentially constant in time. Um, now, 
there are a number of, of, hypoth of, of, of approximations you could make. Remember that what we plotted before was the, the equilibrium, not equilibrium, the steady state rate of production when we had a fixed amount of substrate. Um, in this case, we're not fixing the amount of substrate. So if we wait long enough, we'll run out of substrate and then the reaction will stop. So we're going to assume here that we're going to uh, think over a small enough time scale that the amount of substrate is not changing a lot. Uh, another way to say that would be the amount of substrate is much bigger than the amount of enzyme, uh, or that simply that the rate of production of product is slow, R is small. And so we're going to make the assumption that D, D E S by DT is zero. And clearly, if ES is constant, the rate of production of product is constant. Uh, there are other approximations you can make, which all give rise to the same michaelis menten result. So we're going to make the assumption that DES DT is zero. What is uh, DES by DT? Well, it's the amount of the production of ES is Kf E times S minus Res minus Kres. So I set that to zero. And now I need to eliminate E in favor of Es. And I remember this was something that we did in an early homework where we had a conserved uh, amount of a molecule that all of our enzyme, our enzyme isn't used up. So our enzyme is either present in the form of free enzyme as E or in ES. So E plus ES is a constant, which is the total amount of enzyme. And so now I can say that E is equal to E total, which is a parameter, minus ES. And I can substitute that in. <laughs> Here I'm eliminating E in favor of ES. Uh, and I get Kf times E total minus ES, that's the one thing that's different, that's new, times S minus Kres minus Res. Notice everything is a function of ES. And now I could write ES as a function of S. So I distribute, just manipulate terms to try to get everything uh, separated. So I'm going to get pull out all my S's, collect my ES term. And when I do that, I get something that looks like this, Kf times E total times S minus Kfs plus Kr plus R times ES is zero. So now I can put, I can write ES equals Kf E total times S divided by everything else. There it is. And so this may look a little bit messy, but structurally it's very simple. What it looks like is a rate times S divided by a constant plus S. So I have something that looks like S over one plus S. Well, S over one plus S has the property that it's zero, it's zero. At infinity, it's one. And it has maximal slope at zero. And the slope decreases monotonic. And that's precisely the Michaelis form. I can rearrange things a little bit uh, by dividing through by Kf. And I'll get E total times S divided by Kr plus R over Kf plus S. And this form is, is rather nice because if I ask the question, what is the rate at which I'm producing my product? 
the rate at which I produce my product is R times ES. So I'd multiply through by R to get the, the rate at which I produce the product. But you'll notice that the bigger KF is, the smaller my denominator is, and the faster I produce the product. The bigger KR is, the bigger my denominator is, and the slower I produce my product. The bigger E total is, the faster I produce my product. The one thing that's not obvious is R, because if I have R, here it looks like R is in the denominator, but the rate of production is actually R in the numerator multiplying this. And so then I have to divide through by R to figure out what the dependence on R is. It would be a little bit strange if having the rate of production of product be larger gave you less product. We expect that that, that will actually not, not do what it looks like. Um, there is a, a standard measurement called the Michaelis constant, which is that, uh, that number in the denominator, Kr plus R over Kf. And you say, why would I give this particular combination of forward and backward rates a special name? And the answer is, when S is equal to the Michaelis constant, I have Km divided by Km plus Km. Km divided by 2Km, one half. And so when the concentration <coughs> of my species, of my substrate, is equal to the Michaelis concentration, Km, the rate of reaction is half of its maximum. And so you'll sometimes see uh, Km called the half maximal concentration. And so this is nice. When the concentration is equal to Km, the rate of reaction is half of its maximal value. If S is zero, the rate of reaction is zero. If F is infinity, the rate of reaction will be e total. I can simplify a little bit further by writing V max is equal to R times E total. And then I get the final form of this, which is the simple one. DP by DT, the rate of production of my product is equal to V max times S divided by Km plus S. Notice that, that uh, V max K and Km are hiding a bunch of the rate constants, Kf, Kr, R, E total, and so on. Um, and so uh, I have to have a little bit of, of knowledge of the or algebra that I've done to be able to convert back and forth between the two. Uh, but R, E total, we'll call the maximum velocity of the reaction. That's the fastest it can be. And again, here it's very clear S over Km plus S is equal to zero when S is zero. It's equal to one when S is infinity. It's equal to a half when S is equal to Km. Uh, the one other thing that I might want to do is think about the slope uh, when S is very small. If S is very small, uh, dp by dt, goes like V max over Km times S. So the slope at zero of this function is V max over Km. Sometimes it's nice to do a, a, put things that was called the Betschelde's form. Um, if I divide through by Km over Km, so I write S over Km, I express S in units of Km, uh, then everything becomes uh, unitless and then things are simple. Okay. So one, we made an approximation 
to get this function. And that approximation that we made was to say that uh, we have enough S that the amount of ES is roughly independent of time. Now, if we start out with no ES in our system and start mixing things together, that's clearly not true because initially we'll have E and S combined. So the forward reaction will be fast. Um, and so things are not going to be uh, a quasi steady state um, early in, my, in, in our reaction. And if I wait long enough, I'm going to run out of S. And so then I'll see uh, the amount of S decrease, the amount of ES will decrease, eventually the reaction will stop. So if I wait a very long amount of time, it's also not true. Um, and I can ask, how long is this approximation good for? Well, the approximation is, is fundamentally good when S is much, much bigger than E. Or similarly, when R is much, much less than K forward and K reverse. Uh, in any case, uh, Michaelis met approximation is always going to fail during that initial transient when R and E and S are com com forming the complex. Um, and it's also going to fail when, when the amount of S is comparable to or less than the amount of E. On the other hand, uh, um, provided that you make that the, that the limits that you've observed are right, um, then it works pretty well. And this is from the, that uh, physical biology of the cell textbook. It's an experiment of uh, the rate of ATP hydrolysis by myosin, motor protein. Uh, and here they plotted the rate versus the uh, concentration of ATP. And uh, the, the solid line is the, is the Michaelis function. And the dots are the uh, experimental values and they're right on top of each other. And so this, this shows that, at least in some cases, it's a reasonable approximate. Now, that's the basic Michaelis form, and, and we'll see that a lot. Uh, the other kind of reaction that we'll see pretty often is called the Hill function. And a lot of times we use Hill functions essentially to say we don't know how the thing works. Uh, and so you don't necessarily derive Hill functions, that is, you just assert them. But a Hill function is a sigmoid. And so the difference is going to be that in the Michaelis function, uh, the slope of the rate versus the value of the parameter is maximal at zero. In a Hill function, the slope is zero at zero. Uh, and we'll see that in a second. And as I say, often we will just assert Hill functions and not have any good grounds for them. Uh, but you can also derive a Hill function. And uh, one way to derive a Hill function is to consider what's called a cooperative reaction. Suppose that to produce our product, I have to bind not one molecule of substrate, but three molecules of substrate or four molecules of substrate. So for example, suppose my product were, um, I'm gonna make something up that doesn't really make sense. Suppose that I'm making benzene. So benzene has six carbons. And suppose my substrate was carbon, maybe, maybe carbon monoxide. And I had some catalyst that put it together to make six. I need six carbons to come together to make one benzene. And therefore, to make my reaction happen, I need six rather than one of my substrate molecules. So this would essentially be stoichiometry, which we've talked about before. With stoichiometry, we expect that the rate, uh, if nothing else is going on, we expect that our rate will be mass action. And so essentially here, we're assuming mass action uh, on the part of the substrate. So we say, for our production of product, we need N molecules of S. 
And so we're going to have Kf, the forward reaction will be Kf times the amount of enzyme. Our enzyme maybe has six binding sites or four binding sites, times S to the N. That's mass action on S. And the backward reaction, as usual, uh, doesn't depend on, doesn't have that exponent because the backward reaction is on the complex. There's only one of them. Um, so that would be a way of thinking about this. In reality, almost certainly we don't have six molecules or 10 molecules of S binding to E all at the same instant. In fact, we'd have them binding sequentially. So we'd have E plus S uh, making ES, and then ES combining with S to make E with two S's. And then E with two S's combining with S to make E with three S's and so on. And so that's a cascade reaction. Um, and it's not obvious looking at this that the rate of production of P would be the same on the top and the bottom. And what we'll find is that the uh, temporal dynamics of these two are quite different, but the steady state rates are the same. And again, uh, michaelis menten and, and Hill functions are always neglecting the temporal behavior, the short-term and long-term temporal behavior. They're always looking in the middle of the time. And so now I want to uh, derive the Hill function. And I'm going to do not that stacked one, which is a little more work. Uh, but the same thing that we just did for the Michaelis function. So I'm going to assume that E plus S uh, goes to ES with N, N molecules of S. And I'm going to assume mass action uh, rate of forward reaction, KF times E times S to the N. And I want to know the rate of production of P as a function of the concentration of S. And this is exactly the de derivation I just did for Michaelis, except instead of S, I have S to the N. And so I'm going to assume that the amount of complex ESN is about constant. Well, the forward rate is Kf E times S to the N minus the backward rate Kr E S N minus the production of product R E S N. So I immediately say I'm going to get K R plus R the way I did before. And so now I'm going to write that zero is approximately equal to K F E times S N minus K R E S N minus R E S N. And, and, and on paper, the difference between E times S to the N and E S sub N is clear. Uh, when I say it, I realize that it'll sound like I'm saying the same thing. So I need you to look at the look at what's written on the screen more than what I'm I'm saying while I'm walking. With you. Okay. And so the first thing I'm going to do is distribute out the E S sub N. And so I'll get K F E times S to the N is equal to KR plus R ESN. So I carry that over. And now I can uh, divide through by E sub S E times ESN, the amount of complex, uh, divide through by KF, and I get E times S to the N divided by ESN, the amount of complex, is equal to Kr plus R K over Kf. What is Kr R plus R over Kf? We've seen that before, right? That was uh, our Michaelis function of our, it looks like our Michaelis function. Uh, we'll call that the Hill function, the Hill constant, Kh. And it's gonna have the same property. It's gonna give us the value of the concentration at which the reaction is half maximum. And so I define KH to be KR plus R over KF. I plug that in. E times S to the N divided by ESN is equal to KH. Okay. 
Now I have a little bit of a problem with S because S now is raised to the nth power. And so I have to convert, uh, if I want to rescale S, S, KH has strange units. It has units of concentration to the n, which I don't want. And so I'm going to take the nth root of KH, and that's my half maximal activity concentration. So KR plus R over KF, which is my Michaelis form, I raise it to the one over H power, I'm sorry, one over nth power, where n is the, is the exponent. And now I get something that has units of concentration. I can scale things up. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people use the power, then the, then the units get really ugly. Why is it not called Kn of H in the end there? Kn of H. Yeah, on the last one, it's like you're doing As of N over Es of N equals to Kh. And then, and then yes, because you're saying on the top, right? You're introducing one over N. Uh, but why is it not Kn of H? Is just a notation thing. I just yeah. I think I, I I think I think fair enough. I mean, uh, I, I'm afraid you're going to find that the notation for these Ks is fairly non inconsistent. The H here usually stands for Hill function. Right. Uh, it's not an index, uh, mm -hmm. and so I, 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 I so because I it doesn't I carry can't. meaning, right? Yeah, I got I, it. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I can. I mean, uh, you're free. You're free to. You're free to use any subscripts or superscripts you like. I would just be careful not to use a sub superscript because it'll look like you're raising it to the nth power. It's true, <laughs> uh, but that's a fair point. Uh, the key thing here, though, is that the capital K has units of concentration, which is what we want. And so now I can rearrange, and I get E times Sn, which is the amount of complex. And remember, the amount of the, the rate of production of product is R times that. So now I have the rate of production of product is R times E, the amount of enzyme, times S to the N divided by K to the N. This is a lot of work, but you might've been able to just look at the, look at the functional form and write without having to do anything. Uh, the one thing that we have to do now is the usual, which is we have to get rid of E we don't know E and E and the, the amount of enzyme and the amount of substrate uh, complex separately. Um, so we have to get rid of the amount of free enzyme in favor of the amount of complex and the, the total amount. So now we write E is equal to the total amount of enzyme minus the amount of complex. And we plug that in and we get that the rate of production is E total minus amount of complex times S to the N over K to the N. And now again, we have to, re we have to multiply through and distribute to solve for ESN as a function of SN because we've got S to the N because we've got it on both sides. So I multiply through by, uh, E total minus ESN, I get ESN equals E total times S to the N over KN to the N minus ES to the N, ESN times S to the N over KN. So now I have to pull my ESN to the other side and I'll get one minus, sorry, sorry one plus S to the N over K. To the N. So I'm just rearranging here to put my ESN my complex all on the left. And then I distribute that out. 
and I get the amount of complex times one plus s to the n over k to the n is equal to e total times s to the n over k to the n. I'm going to divide through by that uh, factor on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, and I'll get ESN, which is the rate of production, is equal to e total s to the n over k to the n over one plus s to the n over k to the n. There we go. So this has a dimensionless form because I've scaled the concentration by the, the hill, the hill concentration H, I mean K. So so this this clearly has the form that we had before from Michaelis, except everything is raised to the end. If I want it uh, to be scaled, I multiply through by K over K and I get E total times S to the N over K to the N plus S to the N. So if I set N equal one, I recover my Michaelis form. And that's clearly obviously correct because if I look at my equation, E plus N equals one gives me back the, the enzymatic reaction I started with. And I can, as before, say V max is R times the E total. And I'm left with the rate of production of product is equal to V max S to the N over K to the N plus S to the N. And that's the Hill equation. And so now I can do a little plot because I have an extra parameter now, which is N, which is called the Hill exponent. And a lot of times people use a lowercase h instead of an n for that. So if you see lowercase h, it's usually the exponent. And that exponent is called the cooperativity of the reaction. Now, in our case, we started out by saying there actually are n molecules of S participating. But in a lot of situations, people will try to find a function and then they will back out what that cooperativity is. In other words, they won't have here. We, here we start out by saying there is a reaction with N molecules of S. Instead, people will measure the dependence of the rate on some concentration. They'll get a curve, a sigmoidal curve. They'll fit the slope of that curve to extract that effective exponent. And one thing that often happens biologically when you do that in experiments is that the exponent is large. You'll get the, something like the exponent's eight. Um, and we know that that's not true biologically. So, so there's some sometimes a bit of a mystery about where that exponent comes. Mathematically, we'll find that, that uh, most people will assume, if you don't know anything, that that exponent is four. And when you do uh, dynamical systems theory with, with Hill farms, uh, we typically find that things are well behaved, that, that things change when that exponent is around four. If uh, the exponent is one, two, three, one would be Michaelis, uh, two, three, uh, you get one set of behaviors. If things are four or bigger, you get a different set of behaviors. Sometimes you have to have a bigger exponent to get things to change. Normally it's four. You'll notice again that n equals one is a special case. Uh, for n equals two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 to infinity, the value at zero is zero and the slope at zero is zero. The value at infinity is one and the slope at infinity is zero. For n equals one, the slope is maximal at zero. For n two or bigger, the slope is maximal when s equals k. 
And so there is a fundamental difference in the behavior of Hill functions from Michaelis functions uh, about where the slope of the reaction rate is maximum. For Michaelis, the action happens at small concentrations. For Hill functions, the interesting action happens when the concentration is approximately K. And that has pretty profound consequences for the way biological circuits work, for signaling, for metabolism, for, uh, for gene regulation. If, if you're in a world where you have Michaelis, you expect the, the things interesting things happens when the concentrations are small and you expect concentrations generally to be small. Uh, if you're in a world with Hill functions, you expect that things happen, the, the system switches its behavior when you go from concentration below K to concentration above K. And so you expect that the concentrations of the molecules you're dealing with are around K. And that's not universally true, but it's generally pretty true uh, for, uh, for, um, for most species in cells. Uh, if we want to make things a little bit more abstract, we could define a generalized Hill function, which is x to the n over 0 0.5 to the n plus x to the n. And then we can plug in v max, s over k, and so on. So again, if we compare for n less than or equal to one, uh, the value at zero, zero, no matter what, the slope is maximal at zero, and the value is one over k. The slope is zero for larger n. The value at k is one half, regardless of what the, value, what the exponent is. Uh, in the case of the slope at k, when s equals k is, Intermediate, when n is one or less for Michaelis, it's maximal for n two or bigger. I have the a value, question. Yeah, the value at S grade, infinity is always one, and the slope uh, is zero. Yeah, go ahead. Go. What does what does it mean to be less than one for n in that case? Because if n it's the number of molecules, what is half a molecule? That doesn't make sense, does it? So absolutely. So if I if my derivation start out by saying I have a reaction which involves n molecules, right? And I came up with this functional form. Yeah. Now once I have that functional form, I could look at some experiment. And I say the rate of this reaction is this as a function of the concentration of this molecule. Mm -hmm. And now I can fit that to, to a sigmoid and ask, what is the n that I get? Oh, OK. It's a, a, it, and, it loses the function of being a molecule. Then. Right. So, so, so my motivation for the structure of this, this equation was a reaction involving n, 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 n units of s. But in fact, this is used very generically as a fitting form because I'll find there are lots and lots and lots of chemical reactions where as I change the concentration of the substrate, the rate of reaction goes like a sigmoid. Now, uh, in this case, the sigmoid has a particular symmetry around the K. It's essentially um, linear in S. Uh, the other kind of sigmoid I could have would be one where it's linear in the exp is it's it's logarithmic in S, um, and in that case I would have not uh, s to the n over k to the n plus s to the n. I would have a hyperbolic tangent, which also gives me a sigmoid. But the symmetry in that case um, zero point two instead of zero point two and point eight being symmetrical to each other, it would be uh, and uh, x and one over x would be symmetrical with each other. Um, and there are reactions which work like that as well. Mm -hmm. But but yes, I mean that an n, a, a non-integer n uh, can't be representing a, an enzymatic reaction of the kind that we, we talked about. And certainly n less than one uh, 
is a bit problematic, but it but but you'll find curves where you see it. Um, n less than one is is a little bit unusual, but it, it's not it's not it does happen. Um, but n not an integer uh, for a fit to experiment is not unusual at all. The fit is two point five. N is two point five. N is three point six. So again, we're motivating the structure by starting with a particular reaction, but we're going to find that this form is very general. Any other questions about this? Okay. Um, so one thing that's pretty obvious if I look at my curve is that the bigger N is, the, the more step-like my response is. Again, n equals one isn't step-like at all. Not a, it's not a sigmoid. And bigger than one is a sigmoid. Uh, and if I get n to be something like 20, I basically have a step function. Zero up till s equals k, then it steps up to one and is constant thereafter. And again, I I'm going to find that, that the... Uh, that the typical switching point for this is about four. Um, if if s is if n is less than four, if n is less than four, then I I things will behave relatively smoothly. And if n is bigger than four, I can treat the thing as zero when s is is less than k, and one if s is greater than. And as I mentioned here, we assumed that, that uh, all of the things were reacting at once. But when I have a phosphorylation cascade, somebody uh, looked at MAP kinase cascade, for example, and, and when we were looking at, 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 uh, at uh, signaling pathways uh, in, the, in the biomodels database. And we looked early at the beginning of the class, we said MAP kinase, 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 phosphorylates map kinase, 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 which phosphorylates map kinase, kinase, which phosphorylates map kinase, which phosphorylates map. Um, that kind of stack gives rise to, to sigmoidal activation with a sharp with a sharp threshold. So very much what we're seeing. Okay. Um, one nice thing about this functional form here, x to the n over 0 0.5 to the n plus x to the n, is that if I replace x of the numerator by 0 0.5 to the n of the numerator, or alternatively replace k in the numerator by, uh, s in the numerator by k, then I get a sigmoid that's decreasing. So now if, if X is zero, my value is one. It's still a half when X is a half or a half when uh, S is K. And now it goes to zero instead of to one as S gets large. <laughs> and so now I have a fun two functions, one of which is an increasing function of my argument, s or kx, and one of which is a decreasing function of it, uh, that are, are things that I could use together. And so if I have an activator, uh, I use the increasing hill function. If I have an inhib inhibitor, I use the decreasing hill function. And so this pair is very nice because if I have written the one with the activator, and I say, what would happen if I switch from an activator to an inhibitor? I have to change one symbol in my equations, which is I change the value of the variable, the numerator, to the, 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 to the argument k, to the parameter k. And we can, we can do the same analysis. Uh, there's also a decreasing Michaelis function, which is exactly the same thing. It's k over k plus s. 
And again, the slope is zero. At zero is, is maximal. Uh, for the Michaelis case, it's zero for the Hill function. The value at k is a half. Slope at k is intermediate or maximal. Uh, and it's as the value of s goes to infinity, the value goes to zero. And the slope goes to zero. And so uh, one of the things that we had an issue with in one of the homework problems was I said, what, what happens when things are small, medium, or large? Uh, and now for the first time, we have a sense of what small, medium, and large is. If I ask what is the what does a small value of S mean? A small concentration of our substrate means that the concentration of the substrate is much less than K. A large concentration of substrate means our concentration of substrate is much bigger than K. And an intermediate concentration of substrate means that our concentration of substrate is around K. And so now I have three cases and I can solve each of those three cases and know approximately what happens in those three regimes. I'm gonna skip the derivation of all of these approximations. Uh, they're in the slides, they're not terribly exciting, but if you want to know what the behaviors are, what the typical values and slopes are as a function of S in your regimes, S less than K, S approximately equal to K and S much bigger than K, uh, you can derive all of them. Uh, in the case of Michaelis, increasing Hill, decreasing Kill, Hill, uh, decreasing Michaelis. Um, and those approximations are sometimes useful if you want to do estimation. And now I would like to uh, do a little exercise. And uh, this will be a little tellurium exercise. And we're going to be using, we're going to be using uh, stoichiometry. Really, for the first time, we're going to be using stoichiometry in a model. Uh, so I would, and, and people I think have from last time, uh, the, the basic enzymatic reaction. So I would like people to uh, fire up uh, tellurium. And then I want you to write uh, the reaction E plus N molecules of S. Uh, goes to a complex, assuming mass action. Uh, that's reversible, so the back reaction occurs at a rate that's proportionally amount of complex. And then uh, the uh, complex can react uh, to form, uh, return the enzyme in the product. Um, and I'd start out by just plotting uh, that uh, just plot the amount of uh, complex uh, and the amount of product versus time. Uh, and you're going to find the amount of product keeps going up. So you're going to have to turn that off after a while. Uh, but plot that uh, by itself. Uh, and then I want you to do the Hill approximation, uh, which is E plus NS goes to E plus P at a rate V max S to the N over K to the N plus S to the N. And so you can do this in two ways. You could have two different antimony string, uh, which you calculate and you plot separately, or you could put these two reactions into the same uh, model. But then of course, you'll have to give E and, uh, and S and P a uh, different name. So, the second one for the Hill one, you'd have to do E1, S1, P1, uh, so that the reaction didn't mix. Is that clear? I see, I see, Dole, you're there. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. 
So why don't people give that a shot? And uh, uh, I recommend setting uh, the Hill exponent n, n to be four. Uh, start out with uh, a no complex, so total amount of enzyme of one, total amount of substrate of one, no product and no complex, and set all of your reaction rates, Kf, Kr, R to one. And so I'll give people a minute to try that out and I may ask somebody to, uh, uh, to, um, to show us the results when they've got that going. And if there are any questions about what needs to be done or what makes sense, uh, please just uh, speak up and I'm happy to, to, uh, to go over them. Just a piece of advice, when you uh, power, when you use power to the end, there is the, the hat, not the double star like Python, just a heads up. Yes, that's a, that's a trap that that antimony sets for you. Yes, the um, I should have put that as a reminder in the in the in the uh, slide. Right, the 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 exponentiation function in antimony is a carrot or hat rather than a double star. In early versions of antimony, the comment was always the double slash. And then somebody uh, added the, the hash as a comment sign to make it like Python. Uh, so that was an attempt to make it more Pythonic. Antimony predates people's use of Python. Sorry, I must have missed this, but why does the hill fun the hill function already account for the reversible? That's why there is no reverse, right? From yeah, I guess that's that's the reason, right? It's already well, in the, the K. Right. The production of product is irreversible, right? Yep. So if I go directly from substrate to product, I don't have anything that takes product back to give me substrate. But, as, but you're making a good point. Already, uh, when you notice that, you know that they can't be the same. In other words, the two curves cannot be identical for that reason, if nothing else. So when we use a Hill approximation, we're, we're asserting that these two things are the same. And we'd like to know when that is a reasonable approximation when it isn't. And I should say for the parameters that I gave you, it's not gonna be a terribly reasonable approximation. Now, if you have your enzymatic reaction from last time, 
I think that was also in the in the in the files, uh, the, the the shared files. Um, you can change it pretty quickly, but but typing this out is not that bad. And take your time on it, but if you're when you're done, you could raise your hand or show me that you're so I get a sense of how long it takes. I don't want to distract people, but in, in the homework, um, you had a lot of hill functions. When, when you were given a lot of, of regulatory or signaling networks um, where it explicitly gave you uh, reaction rates, those were all hill functions. And if you look in those appendices uh, in Herbert's textbook, You'll see a lot of hill functions, and then you'll see some more complicated forms. It basically, ask the question: If you have two chemicals interacting with each other, you have signal one and signal two, and they both are regulating something, uh, how do they combine? And there are a bunch of different ways hill functions can combine. And so that's uh, that makes things a little more complicated. Is there some reason why uh, for a reaction equation, you can specify uh, a constant, like uh, I can say E plus four S goes to something, um, but I'm having difficulties um, saying E plus N S and then defining N. Uh, yeah, so this is a this is a glitch in 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 anemone. You have to give it a number. So you're gonna you're gonna have a you're gonna have a problem. You can't you can't have a stoichiometry of the variable. That's a pain. That's supposed to be fixed real soon now. So pick a number like four and just put, put the put n equals four in. So this is how I did it. Uh, as you point out, you, you can't have a, a variable stoichiometric coefficient. That's supposed to be fixed, but it's not fixed in this version of tellurium online. So I picked four as my exponent. And then you have the carrot for exponentiation. And then I, I, for the second one, I just used the number one to distinguish the variables uh, for the two. And now I can compare them and you'll notice that uh, they're not that different. Um, 
At short times, there's some difference, but at long times, they come pretty close to each other. Did people you, get something similar to that? Could you scroll up uh, to your function definitions? Thank you. And it's not the prettiest. I'm sure people could come up with a nicer one. I think your Vmax, isn't Vmax supposed to be E plus E S? Ah, good point. Why can I get away with it? Well, at the beginning, because it's equal to one and zero, so you find it's one right. at the end. That's right. And remember that the, the equal, equal signs aren't re aren't, aren't reevaluated, only evaluated on load. But if I wanted to be safer about that, you're right. It should be uh, E plus. And in this case, Vmax is actually for the second one. So it should be E1 rather than E. And it should be E1 plus ES1, right? There is no ES1 uh, for. Um, for the second one, because I don't have, I don't have, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have that the intermediate, right? So all I have is e. So it looks like that. If I wanted to do v max for the first one, I should have. But it should have been e one, not e. Uh, I have a question. Sure, Grant. So how many different situations does this Hill approximation really work for? We have this one specific example here, but how generally applicable is it to other stoichiometric reactions? So for stoichiometric reactions, it's reasonably limited. Uh, for signaling and for signaling and gene regulatory networks, it's almost universally used. So anytime you write, uh, anytime you write uh, a situation where the rate of production of a, of a uh, gene is a function of the concentration of a uh, promoter, uh, then uh, almost always that rate of production of the gene will be written as a Hill function of the promoter concentration. Okay, thank you. Um, the only, the only question that you'll run into there is sometimes things are, are logarithmically scaled so that uh, it's a, you, you basically take the logarithm of everything uh, on the concentration side. And that that's, uh, depends on whether things depend on fold chain, whether things depend on, on concentration in linear fashion or on fold chain. There's some speed, some situations in which you need to, to, to do that. But but uh, it's pretty standard. If you draw if you draw a signaling network or, or a gene regulatory network, and you don't know anything about the rates of reaction, uh, you will turn each one of those uh, into a Hill function. And typically, you'll assume that the Hill functions all go between zero and one and that the k's are all a half and that the uh, exponents are all four and uh, in reality it's not like that but but as a as a null hypothesis uh, if you don't know anything else about what's going on that's usually what's assumed is there I, I have not gotten a chance to read very much about it, but I'm aware from some of Herbert's books that he is in part not a fan of the Hill function because it's only irreversible reactions. I know he talks a little bit about um, irreversible Hill in one of his books. Is that something that gets used in place for some of these approximations or is that more of just kind of like a niche thing that exists? Well. Again, in this particular case, the Hill function really does represent at some level what's happening, right? Right. We wrote, we wrote the, what we did here was we wrote, we wrote the, uh, the function, 
the, the, the enzymatic reaction. We wrote the enzymatic reaction and we wrote the Hill function and we ran them together and they're not identical, but they're pretty close. So uh, if, we, if we made this approximation, except at, at very short times, you know, between time zero and two, they're relatively different. After time two, they're almost indistinguishable. Of course, it depends on what accuracy we want. If we want things to be accurate to 1%, maybe not. Biology, usually, if you're within 10%, you're doing pretty well. I mean, would this... That's in part, though, because the final step of this reaction is itself um, irreversible in this stoichiometry, right? right? That's okay. right. That's right. Now, now um, what I would say is, what I would say here is that we're, we're dealing with a special case, which is an enzymatic, a collective enzymatic reaction. We're showing that in this case, it works pretty well. But in general, if I say that A regulates B, and the rate of production of B is, is a Hill function of A, then uh, there's no particular reason that that functional form should be a Hill function. On the other hand, uh, I know that the rate should be low when A is, if A is an activator, the rate should be low when A is low. It's got to have a maximum, so it's got to saturate. And so it's got to be a sigmoid. And when I write a sigmoid, there basically are only two sigmoidal forms that, that we use. One of them is a Hill function, and the other one of which is a hyperbolic tangent. Now, there are other sigmoids you can write, uh, but they're all pretty similar. Um, the key thing is that, that when, when the value is much less than k, it's zero. When the value is much bigger than k, it's one. And near k, there's some slope. Um, now, now uh, I understand Herbert's concern in the context of, of chemical reactions, uh, but, but you know, uh, if I'm doing regulation, uh, the regulation is irreversible. I don't have, I'm not, because I'm not using up my, my regulator, right? I mean, so, so there isn't there isn't a back reaction when I'm doing gene tra gene transcription translation. Oh, there's a question about why I have k being uh, equal to my parameters to the one over nth power. It wasn't not that the question. I think he tried to do everything at one step instead of classifying Vmax. And so if you look at his code over there on Sean, yeah, yeah, it's like he's dividing by the definition, but on the definition, he forgot to raise to one over n. I think that's why it's not working. Uh, actually, I, I think it's working fine. It's just um, I, I was expecting it to match uh, what Professor Glazier has here, which um, even uh, like the code you provided, Joel, does not look like that. Um, but my code does look like yours, so I'm assuming it's correct. But maybe maybe I made a mistake. You want to show us? I, and does anybody else? Did anybody else forget what I get got? And did other did or did people get something different? I'm, Mine I'm is a little bit of, different. I'm quite capable of making a mistake, so let's see what you got. Professor Glee. Oh, never mind. Sorry, uh -huh. Connor. No, I was just gonna ask. I, I was comparing mine to yours and the bottom concentrations of your picture were cut off at the very end there, but that's okay. Joel or, or or was it Sean? Did you want to show us? Oh, I Juliana, if I made a mistake, please catch me, okay? I think the only difference is this E1 is not the same, but I, again, I defined it both of them, but it's not the same as yours. Yours has a, a hump that goes back, which is... So that's interesting. So everything else looks okay. 
Um, so you have E, you have E as a, con E is constant here, isn't it? E, oh, it's, yeah, I mean. So, so let's constant see. So, okay, so I say, so E1, where's E1? E1 is right below. Uh, in your, in your plot. E1 is the red, it's this line here. So it goes down. And in the other case, it doesn't go down at all. Yeah, it stays constant. Which makes sense, it shouldn't, it shouldn't go down. And in my case, it doesn't go down either, it stays constant. Because you use it, you're not using it up, right? You're, you yep. E on both sides, not doing anything. So, so in my case, it's E1 that's constant because it's J4 is my, is my hill one. So it should be constant. So the difference is in J1, where I have E is used up. So I have E plus 4S goes to ES. ES goes to E plus P. ES goes to E plus 4S. That looks right to me. So let's see what you got. Um, I think you might have missed ES goes to E plus P in line six, because you just have just P. You are right. That's it. Thank you. I guess it would be E1, right? Yep. You got it. Thank you so much, Lindsay. There you go. Yeah. It's so yeah. easy to miss. Anybody else? Uh, all right. So that actually worked pretty well. Um, now, there are a couple of things that, that, that don't work so well. So remember, we sorry, there's something I'm allergic to here in this room. So if you see me scratching and sneezing, uh, I apologize, but something in the air, air handler has blown in that is, is highly allergenic. So I appreciate your patience with it. Uh, so uh, one thing that we assumed in, when our, in our derivation was that uh, the amount of ES, the, the amount of complex was about constant. And clearly, if we look at the plot for ES in a little bit more detail, that's the green curve, which is sort of compressed in the, when we did it all in one plot. Uh, the amount of ES changes. It peaks early and then comes down again. Um, so that approximation wasn't very accurate. But even so, the agreement between the Hill function and the, and the enzymatic function is pretty good. Um, uh, if if I look at very short times, there's some differences. But once I once I get past uh, time about two. My rates are pretty good, and so so this uh, this uh, would give us uh, a reasonable answer. Um, if you make the the substrate concentration constant now um, by putting a dollar sign on your s, uh, what happens? And you'll have to put a dollar sign on your s one and your s both because uh, you've got it twice. Anybody, what happens?
Does it make a difference? Yeah, I think the pro the it goes to infinity. Yeah, it goes to infinity. DS well, because the amount of product we're producing now is is we keep making product because we don't run out of substrate now. So this is one of these cases where you'd rather not display the product amount because it dominates everything else. But if I if I look at this, uh, I'll just show it since we're gonna. I don't want to run out of time too much. Um, if if we look at this together now, what we'll see is that at very short times they're different because it, it takes time for that E plus N S to make a complex. Once the complex is formed, they're identical going forward. Now, why doesn't the amount of product catch up? Well, if I'm producing things at a constant rate and I start producing at a slightly different time, then I never catch up. So that's why there's a constant difference between the two. But effectively, when I say that the amount of substrate's constant, uh, I get the exact result. So, uh, So now all the rates are, are, are identical. So the last thing I'd like you to do, uh, let me just see if I, how I did it. Yeah. So the last thing I'd like you to do, uh, these the, I have a series of exercises that aren't that exciting. Uh, so we're got, I'm not worried about missing them. But the one thing I would like you to do here is now would be to scan S and see if you get the Hill function. So what I'd like you to do is uh, use that little code snippet that we generated before, it's in the screen now, and uh, scan, um, scan S and plot the rate of reaction versus S. Let's see if you get the, the, the get the, the uh, the exponent, the, the, the sigmoid that you want. Uh, and that it would be nice to be able to scan the value, the parameter n, the exponent n, but we can't do that. Uh, we could do that in the, in the hill one because we could change the value of n there, but we can't change it in the enzymatic one because we don't have any way of making in line two. We can't make uh, the, the, that, um, the multiplicity of, of S be, uh, uh, be a, a variable. That's a limitation of Adam. Okay, so is it, people give it give this a shot to uh, to to make to do this, and that'll be our last exercise for today. If you could do this, I think everything in the whole works is straight. I better load NumPy. Forgot to load. I continually wonder why Python doesn't just load NumPy as a default. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, okay.
And here I, I was offsetting uh, the J4 by a tiny bit, so it's easier to see the difference. The winds up, they lie right on top of each other. So if you don't offset them, you don't see them. Oops. Just be careful there. You're defining S1 and S on RS1. And I don't think you have you have, you know, S1 in your oh you do. Okay. But you I think you meant S and S1, right? Yeah. This is why I never use the Sunday States law. Uh Let's see if it works with R dot concert boyity analysis. Nope. I think you have a spelling error in okay. yeah. Still doesn't work. Singular matrix. Okay. So uh, solution is just to run it. So instead of doing this, I'm just going to do it R dot simulate. Sometimes the fancy stuff doesn't this isn't working. So that's a hill function. Now, in this case, in this case, uh, well, I can't do the long time behavior with, with, without uh, forcing S to be constant, because the long time behavior with S not constant is nothing, because S goes to zero, right? If I don't, if I take my dollar signs out, I'm going to wind up with zero. Nothing now. Did people get that? Were people able to make that work? Yes, no. They want to look at my code. They want to look at other code. Yeah, I, I got it. Um, I need to combine the two curves because I had written my models separately, but I got the hill function. I think if you do, if you write your models separately, probably the the the, the steady state analysis should work. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I did the steady state analysis for the first one, and it, it it did come out right. So, so what? Because one of the problems is if you have two, so so when you do steady state analysis, the, the, technically, the 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 system does a matrix inversion, and if you have two independent submatrices, then the matrix is singular, and so it's not invertible. And so that conserved buoyancy analysis is supposed to tell the, the solver to look for a, for a singular matrix and handle it properly. That doesn't always do it. Anybody else, did that work for people or not work for people? So one thing we could do is let's try making this eight. Unfortunately, it would be nice if we could make that a parameter, but we can't, we have to do it by hand. So I'll have to change those to eight. And then we also have to change our value of n to eight here. Steeper. What if we make it something that, something that uh, that uh, Joel said shouldn't be possible, like a half. I'm actually not sure what'll happen here. I don't know if it'll run. Yeah, the stoichiometry works for half. 
So you get that different structure. In this case, my steps are a little bit too big. I'd have to make this smaller. Okay. So, so I can't, unfortunately, I can't parameter scan the exponent. But I can parameter scan the, 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 the variable. I have kind of a way to parameter scan the exponent. Um, okay, you want to show us? Yeah, it's sort of half working right now, but I can share. I, I've gotten it to work before, so um, it's it's got to do with um, Python string editing. So basically, wherever you need to insert your um, your uh, stoichiometric parameter, you put percent s and then just after you declare the string you can put in whatever values you want for each of those placeholders in the string so if i were to do something like this and define all the values that i wanted to do it would work oh um it would if, <laughs> if i had multiple plot functions um but essentially for e each each loop it would simulate for one and then simulate for two and then for four. Well, so that would be nice because you could use the same little, uh, the same little VStack game that I use now with that, with changing the parameter, changing that, that stoichiometry. So, so actually, if you're willing to, 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 to clean that up and send that around, I'll send that to everybody in the class. That would be very useful. Yeah, sure. And I actually would add that to my lecture next time because, because I've talked about this with some people individually that there are situations in which you have to you have to write a string operator that manipulates the antimony code. Uh, and I've said that generically, but I haven't ever shown anybody how to do it. And now you've shown people how to do it. And so several people had projects that would depend on that. And so I think that that's very great. I think that that's a very, very ingenious. So I appreciate that. I think people will like that. And I'll add that to the little code snippets uh, that I teach people. That's, uh, it's funny, I, I don't mean to be critical. Philosophically, that's very antithetical to the way antimony works because you're not really supposed to be going in and, hand, and, and, and overwriting antimony with Python. But uh, given the limitation in antimony, it's very natural to do that. And actually, uh, what you've shown is, is very elegant way of doing it. Um, there are some, some very elaborate uh, code generators, like BioNetGen, uh, that are big packages that are designed to, 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 generate to generate, in this case, SPML rather than antimony streams. Um, to get around the limitations of SPML. Uh, and so uh, uh, to show that in, in this context as a, in a simple example, I think is really valuable. So I appreciate that. That's a great, a great example and we'll definitely put that out. Okay, any other comments or questions before we break? Okay. I have one. It's so, uh, so more it's administrative. I think it's to do with the homeworks because now it seems that for the next week we have three homeworks with the project or two homeworks, right? The, the, this, the project one and the fifth one again. Is that correct? There should be two, I think. Okay. One of which is the, the homework that was due today, which I gave you an extra week on. Um, because we hadn't done all of the things uh, in it. And then I'm asking you to get start getting ready for the project. So the other, the other two problems are, are, are project-related problems. Okay. Yep, okay. Uh, if there are three, uh, then there's a mistake on my part. No, I think it's just two. I might have confused the continuation with uh, something else. Yep. I mean... 
occasionally it, it, I've had it is, issues in 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 Canvas where somehow Canvas will turn on the homeworks from last year automatically. And then I'll assign a homework. And so you'll see two, a ghost, which is you'll see the last year assignment plus the new one. It, and if, if, they're, if they're basically identical, then it's clear that it's the same thing twice. But if, if for example, we're a week behind or a week ahead so that it looks different, then it, then it really looks like two assignments. So, so let me know if that happens. All right, thank you. Sorry, somebody else had a comment? Oh, I was just saying that it is I, it is just two homeworks. Um, I think the confusion, and I had this same confusion, which is the fact that the project was labeled as homework number six, whereas in previous uh, instances of the project, it was not labeled as a homework number. So people were thinking that it was a, an actual, like one of the regular homeworks as opposed to part of the project. Right, I guess, I guess, the the pro that the way that it's the way it worked was that the that the evaluation of, of another of the of the uh, you're right probably it should have been assigned as a project assignment instead of a homework one uh, um, so so I appreciate your patience for the inconsistency of the label I guess. Originally, I had a homework six, which had problems, normal problems in. And then I said, well, we haven't gotten to the feed forward network yet. And we won't get to that this week. So I don't want to assign it uh, this week. And so then I, I deleted those problems and, and pasted, the, pasted the new problems into that homework set. So, so uh, uh, but you're right that, that, that uh, notationally, that's inconsistent. Thank you. Any other issues before we break? So next week, I remind you, uh, we're, we're online only because I'm gonna be in Vancouver. And so we'll be, we'll be, I'll be doing the, the class from Vancouver. So I appreciate your patience with that. And I thank everybody for today. And uh, I appreciate everybody taking the time to meet with me about their projects. I think people are, making progress. I do encourage you to get the, the code, some code running as quickly as possible. Because again, the, getting the code running is, 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 is definitely work, but, but, but writing it up, presenting it and uploading it is a lot of work. And so uh, the sooner you have some running code, the, the, the easier it'll be to, uh, to make sure the projects go forward. Okay, thank you everybody, uh, good night. And uh, I will see you uh, by Zoom next week. Let's see you.